Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm seeing many participants uh, sign on this afternoon or morning, depending upon where you are. But my name is Sheila Joy. I'm NASCO's Executive Director, and I just want to give you a very warm welcome. We're very excited about this uh, Remaining Useful Life webinar today. There's been a great level of enthusiasm and interest. So it's my hope that you leave here in the next 90 minutes knowing a lot more and having a lot more confidence in the subject. So thanks again. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to share a little bit about NASCO. We did have many registrants who are not NASCO members, and that's very exciting to us because our objective is really to support the entire industry. So um, if you'll just bear with me for a moment, I'd like to share a little bit about our organization. We are a 501c6 trade association, and our headquarters is in Frederick, Maryland. That is just outside, about an hour outside of DC. We were established in 1976 with one core mission, and that was to set standards for the assessment, maintenance, and rehabilitation of underground infrastructure, but also to fairly and equally assure the continued acceptance and growth of all trenchless technologies. Uh, this mission has been around for many years, obviously, and it continues to really be the foundation of who we are and what we do. Our vision is to build awareness of aging underground infrastructure and provide solutions not just build the awareness, but we provide those solutions in three key areas. One of them is education, and many of you on the, on the webinar today will be familiar with our PACP program, which is really the cornerstone of much of what we do. We to date have uh, certified around 40,000 individuals and that number is growing. We also offer NASCO's inspector training certification program, which is also growing in, in popularity and in um, in interest, so we're very grateful for that. NASCO also develops technical resources. I guess you could uh, consider this webinar to be one of them. We also, are, through the work of our committees primarily, but we also provide specification guidelines that once again are available for the entire industry. We publish um, manuals of practice and there's just an awful lot that falls kind of under that umbrella. The third part is advocacy, and recently NASCO has become extremely involved in advocating for the entire industry for the proper funding of underground infrastructure. And in fact, over the past 10 days, um, our members and I and our government relations um, consultant, we've participated in 30 separate meetings with congressional leaders, many of them included the senators or congressmen or congresswomen themselves. So we're very happy about that. NASCO represents everyone in our industry, primarily um, developed or formed rather to uh, represent contractors. Over the years, we have really begun to parallel or mirror our, our whole industry. So if you look at this little chart, you'll see the 21% represents public agencies or the utilities that own the systems. 22% are consulting engineers. Many of those people are the ones who recommend the rehabilitation methods. And we also have suppliers and manufacturers of equipment and materials, institutions of higher learning. But I bring this to you today because we are extremely active. We're making a difference, but we can't do it with, with the industry not participating. So if you're not a member, uh, you'll see at the bottom there a little link to nasco.org join. I invite you uh, to check that out, and we would love to have you be part of our organization. Uh, before we begin again, I'd, I'd also like to give a special thank to our NASCO Technical Advisory Council. Uh, this group of individuals came together just over a year ago uh, to form this council to provide experience in all trenchless technologies, different um, rehabilitation methods, different um, perspectives. So we have engineers, we have people who've come in through the field work. Um, it's just a great group of people and you will be hearing from all of them today with the exception of Lynn Osborne, but I don't wanna leave him out because Lynn was actually critical in the um, evaluation of what we will be sharing today. So just extremely excited to have these folks part of NASCO and, and they have just made a huge impact over the past year and a half. I'd also like to thank our sponsors. Uh, sponsorships have changed since COVID hit. We no longer have events. And so we are very grateful to these companies for stepping up and providing um, funds so that we can make e public events like this possible. So thanks to all of you. I'd like to just take a moment now to uh, excuse me, introduce our moderator, Chris Garrett. 
you saw on the slide before that Chris Garrett is also part of our Technical Advisory Council. In fact, he's the chair of our council. Um, he also is Vice President uh, Brown and Caldwell in Norfolk, Virginia. But Chris was one of the early adopters of PACP. He actually became uh, certified the first year. I think he was in maybe the fifth class that was ever offered. And that same year in 2002, he became a trainer. So he has really been um, an advocate for NASCO and for PACP for many years. Chris also a couple of years ago became trained and certified in ITCP um, and the CIPP technology. So Chris is very well-rounded, very objective, and he's just doing a stellar job of leading our council. So with that, I will introduce Chris. Well, thank you, Sheila. And um, hello to everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, First, I want to give you a, a, a guide of what uh, we're going to be doing today, some housekeeping, if you will. Uh, this is going to be about a 90-minute uh, webinar, and we want to be respectful of your time. Uh, because of that, uh, there won't be any uh, chat feature, and there will be no questions during this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, we did ask for um, questions previously, and some of those will be embedded uh, in the presentations, as you'll see as polls. But we are going to give you an opportunity to uh, ask questions. You should be getting an email tomorrow. Uh, with any uh, questions or additional information that you may need. And we are going to do our darndest to uh, be responsive in a timely manner to you, um, maybe after the holidays. So we appreciate your patience with that. So when we talk about the uh, this webinar and how we're moving forward with the next slide, uh, you'll see that uh, the information that's presented here was on the uh, the tech tips. These tech tips were not only on the uh, website for NASCO, NASCO.org, but also very generously um, published in the Underground Construction uh, Magazine. The three uh, articles um, mirror how we're going to be uh, laying out the, the presentations today. Uh, from the beginning of um, PACP, how it relates to the engineering judgment part of, of um, the work and uh, how we make our decisions uh, through the arc of rehab. Uh, we have three speakers from our Technical Advisory Council, uh, Jerry Weimer, um, Chris Macy, and Khalil Ream. Uh, we also have uh, representatives from the um, owner uh, utility side, uh, mostly from a small and a large diameter uh, aspects. Uh, and they'll be introduced um, as we go further. So it's going to be a full spectrum uh, presentation and uh, we're excited about um, presenting this to you. These tech tips are actually available to uh, be downloaded for you. So as we go further, understand that uh, NASCO, as Sheila said, there are other uh, webinars available to us. Um, our committees are very, very active right now. Uh, each one of them is doing a, uh, a bang up job and presenting information that I personally find very useful. Um, and we also have education that are be presented in May with the conferences uh, with you, um, the Underground Construction Technology uh, Conference in May, but also the water, wastewater equipment treatment and transport uh, show or the wet show uh, also in May. Also with the wet show, there will be a virtual uh, presentation and our part of it will be really talking about the infrastructure funding uh, mechanisms that may be coming out and look for that in February. So as we go through and start the uh, presentations, our first presenter here will be uh, Jerry Weimer. Uh, as you can see here, uh, not only is Jerry a master trainer, Jerry was also a, uh, a trainer of the year uh, for uh, PACP, MACP, and LACP. But what I really like about Jerry is he has a lot of practical experience uh, in his previous life with Cincinnati uh, MSD. He had a wealth of uh, experience on the o and side that he brings to us every day. And I'm really thrilled to be associated with Jerry and looking forward to his comments. Jerry? Hey, our, we have a poll question. Okay. Does PACP define the remain useful life of the gravity sewer pipe? Please answer now. Thank you. 
Well, good. 77% of you said no. And 23% said yes. And we're going to go through and we're going to answer this question as I go through my presentation. We will answer this question. The next slide. Okay, what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about the history of PACP and remaining useful life. So we're first going to discuss early PACP and early remaining useful life and how they were defined together. Okay, and then we're going to get into what problems we had with the early remaining useful life by using just the PACP. And then I'm going to discuss how PACP and remaining useful life are used together now, currently. So in the early days prior to version six in 2010, we had five grade scores one through five, one being minor to five being immediate. And they each had a remaining useful life definition with them. So a grade one, which may be a circumferential fracture or crack was a minor defect. So we had failure unlikely to happen in the foreseeable future. A grade two, the remaining useful life, the pipe was unlikely to fail for at least 20 years. So we had a little more severe defect. Three, we're getting into the moderate defects. And now the pipe was expected to fail somewhere in 10 to 20 years in the future. A grade four, now we're getting into the poor pipe, the more serious defects. And the predictions were that the pipe would fail somewhere in the next five to 10 years. Then we get into the fives, collapsed pipe, things of that nature. The pipe has already failed or is likely to fail in the next five years. And that was a very simplified definition. We did have a qualifier attached with this, okay, that said that this rate needed to be verified by research, but also that it would depend on local conditions, okay? But a lot of people ignored that qualifier and just used the PACP as their remaining useful life. So they were making decisions on when to rehabilitate, when to replace based on PACP alone. And we're gonna discuss what some of those problems were. So some of the things that were not included that people didn't take into condition was the consequence of failure, okay? What's around the sewer, okay? What's above it? Is it in the street? Is it in the forest? Is it under the grass, okay? What, can, what is it going to affect? Are we gonna shut down a hospital? Are we gonna shut down a factory, or we're going to have to close the highway, things like this that were not taken into account when we were determining remaining useful life. And then we had the local conditions. Go back. The local conditions that were not included, okay? We didn't include different things about that area of the pipe, okay, around the pipe, and soil conditions, things like this that we're gonna talk about a little more, but that had a big impact on the pipe. And then the third thing was that we used the scores four and five directly, not putting them in context. Because we have some grade four scores that are more severe than other grade four scores when we talk remaining useful life. Same with grade fives. Some grade fives are gonna deteriorate a lot quicker than other grade fives. So we can't just use the score of four, one, two, three, four, five. We need to then go into the defects themselves. So some things we were not considering, the soil. Did we have clay? Did we have sand? Okay, soil that could come into, would it feed into our pipe or not? Okay, did we have rock or stone? Okay. How was it backfilled? Did we backfill properly using good bedding material? Did we backfill properly coming up in lifts and protecting that pipe all the way so that the pipe was surrounded with good soil, solid material, all the way up? Was the pipe trench width correct? Okay, that's a big factor as well. The, so all of these things come in and then we need to talk about pipe materials. 
Okay, was it clay pipe, BCP? Was it concrete, ductile iron or cast iron or PVC? All of the, or even brick. These pipes all have the same defects that can occur in them, but these defects are going to react and deteriorate differently in different pipe materials. A perfect example is a fracture. If I have a longitudinal fracture in vitrified clay pipe, that fracture may not change for decades. It may stay the same. But that same longitudinal fracture in PVC pipe, now the pipe has structurally failed, okay, once it is fractured. So two different materials, the same defect, completely different results when we start talking remaining useful life. The depth of the pipe, this comes into play as well. Okay, is it shallow where anything on the ground can affect it, vibrations and things? Is it very deep where maybe we have more pressure from above, but the surface undulations and things may not affect it as much? Okay, so a lot of things. Then we get into the groundwater with depth. Okay, because the deeper we are, the more likely we're going to be in that groundwater table. What the groundwater table does when it comes up above the pipe is it comes into the pipe through defects with infiltration, but it also brings the soil with it. We call that infrorosion, and that weakens the pipe because that soil has helped supporting the pipe. And one of the main things is when we lose that soil, we start losing the strength of the pipe. It becomes a big issue. And then again, the surface conditions. What is above it? Is it out in the middle of a field where the heaviest thing is a lawnmower going over it? Or is it in a major construction area where I have semis bouncing over it all day long, vibrating it, making it get damaged? Or is it under a building or a swimming pool, something like that, or even under a creek or a river or stream? These all affect how that pipe is going to last and how it's going to deteriorate. So, how do we use PACP with remaining useful life now? Well, we do not define remaining useful life by PACP, but PACP is the beginning of the story, the beginning of the calculation. So we use the scoring one through five, then we get dig into those into the individual defects within those. And then we take in the other supplemental information the soil condition, the groundwater, the location, all of those other things, the pipe material, okay? Do we have harsh conditions inside the pipe, maybe hydrogen sulfide or other conditions that can damage the pipe? Or what about our cleaning? Are we cleaning aggressively that can damage the pipe or are we cleaning frequently? Both of those can help contribute to the deterioration of that pipe and shorten the remaining useful life. So now we do not define remaining useful life with PACP, but it is the starting point for getting to remaining useful life. So in conclusion, the early PACP and remaining use of life had issues regarding what was not included in the calculations and the documentation, okay? That consequence of failure, the local conditions, using the scores out of context instead of then dragging down to the individual defects, okay? We didn't include the cleaning. We didn't include internal things such as hydrogen sulfide and other things that may be harsh to the environment in an industrial area. So we did not include those, which we do need to include. And we do include them now with remaining useful life using PACP as the starting point and working our way through that and adding the other supplemental information. Okay, and now Chris Macy, he's gonna go through how we use the PACP and this other supplemental information to then determine what is the remaining useful life and how we address it from there. Thank you. All right, well, thanks, Jerry. I, I really appreciate that. Um, uh, a couple words about uh, what Jerry just uh, presented. Uh, in uh, the United States, I've been told that uh, we have 800,000 miles of uh, uh, sanitary sewer. 
um, a vast majority of that, maybe 90% or more, is a 12 inch to 8 inch size. Uh, a lot of that is old uh, uh, VCP pipe. Uh, it's uh, rigid, and uh, a lot of the uh, considerations that Mr. Macy is going to talk about here apply uh, directly to the small diameter aspects. Um, if you don't know uh, uh, Chris Macy, um, you know, you're, you're missing someone who is a, a real treat to, uh, to be with, but also just a wealth of experience. As you can see, he is in not just a, a America's technical practice leader for AECOM. He's just really a, a, in the infrastructure world. He is an international superstar. Um, if you've been to any of the conferences or have had any of the manuals of practice, you'll see his name all over it. Uh, it's a real privilege to work with Chris on this, and um, I always learn something when I, I um, catch up with them, and I've even told them that when I uh, grow up, I'd like to be just like him. So with that, uh, I'll hand it over to Chris. Thank you. Make me, make me blush. <laughs> so poll question number two, is rehab needed for older vitrified clay tile pipe showing no visible signs of deterioration? A poll question will come up and you will be tested on your answer later. It's obviously a very deep thought, long, complex question. Aha, all right. We have the same, the same split, same distribution. So we can get into, into, this, into some introduction and we'll give an overview of what we're gonna talk about. An intro slide would be good. There we go. We're going to cover a couple things today. Uh, we're going to cover off uh, a certainly um, some initial discussion on why most gravity pipes fail. And uh, as, as uh, Jerry has laid the groundwork for, uh, and I think I will talk about as a big history buff, is understanding the problem, it goes back a lot further than you, you think. And uh, as, as Jerry had said, that certainly condition assessment for remaining a life, it starts with PACP. It doesn't end there. A key aspect of it is using supplementary information. I, uh, I, I think it would be remiss for me not to say what is remaining useful life. I, it's probably one of my pet peeves and passions in life is someone asked me how long the pipe will last. And they ask it just, you know, how long will a concrete pipe last? How long will a clay tile pipe last? And the problem is there's not one answer to this. That's why we do condition assessment. That's why we study all these supplementary factors. You ask how long a clay tile pipe? Well, there's clay tile pipe that we know was installed in 4000 BC in Babylonia. And how do we know that? Is because it's still there. Is that we dig it up and we look at it and it looks brand new. Uh, how long will concrete pipe last? There's concrete pipe we know that was installed in about 850 BC. And how do we know that? Because it's still in service. We also have clay tile pipe that got broke. It got broke really, really quick. And you'll see some of the early experiments that, uh, that Anson Howard, uh, Anson, uh, Marston Anson uh, had, you know, had looked at in terms of how quickly they can break. So if you, if you don't design it, if you don't build it, so this bell curve is very, very big and that's why condition assessment plays a role. But the, the reasons that pipes break down are well understood. One of the practical things you have to understand is that we'll have different classes of way that deterioration occurs, but we're not going to calculate remaining useful life to three decimal places. But we can calculate it or we can use inference and good engineering judgment to, to basically extend rate, you know, remaining useful life. What, what Kaz is going to talk about today, Kaz Zurich is going to talk about ways to extend remaining useful life with intelligent intervention and, and strategic you know, intervention in a manner that, that stops what's going to cause it to fail. Uh, what, what Mark is going to talk about today are ways to manage risk, to get a good understanding of just because it looks bad doesn't mean that you have to do something about it today in, in terms of managing risk. And those are all things that we're going to learn from, from understanding remaining useful life. So if we could go to the next slide. 
I, I live in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Uh, Kaz will explain where that is because Kaz and I both come from the same city. Uh, when I started out in this business in the uh, early 80s, uh, I was very young. I was maybe 12 to be an engineer. And, and, uh, but I had calculated we were replacing sewers in Winnipeg, Manitoba at that time. If they just took the funding divided by the length, we were fixing each sewer once every 1,874 years. And, and I thought that doesn't sound like a really good equation. And lo and behold, by the 1980s, uh, we started to lose about a vehicle a year, sometimes two, in, in gigantic sinkholes. And, uh, and that was pretty sobering and, and, uh, and helped to you know, get an understanding of it and, and certainly piqued my interest in trying to understand what was going on and why pipes fail. So the vast majority of pipes we're going to talk about today are certainly rigid pipes because we look at older infrastructure. We didn't invent sort of flexible pipes except for you know, brick structures. Uh, uh, the you know until, until more recent times so the vast majority of stuff that we're looking on are rules for rigid pipe things like concrete and clay tile pipe the thing about a rigid pipe is it it certainly won't accept deter you know by definition it doesn't accept deformation without breaking and uh, and and from a practical perspective from a geotechnical perspective if it's rigid and it doesn't deform it can only mobilize what are called active soil pressures and active soil pressures are a lot less than passive soil pressures. Soil's a neat thing that if you just press on it a little bit, it's a lot more resistant and it has a lot more strength than if you don't press on it. So that's what a rigid pipe does. It exists off active soil pressures. Passive soil pressures come with all flexible pipes. But once that pipe fails, once it breaks, all of a sudden it sees passive soil pressures. And it relies on soils a lot. So it might seem a little strange, but to fully understand the longevity of most broken rigid pipes, we need to understand something about the ground around the pipe. And that means we need to, we need to delve a little deeper and go back and, and, and look in a little more detail. So on the next slide, you'll see basically a reiteration of what, what Jerry said is that it doesn't end with PACP, but it certainly starts there. And, and you know, core and ingrained in PACP, and, and if you ever, if you ever swore at Jerry under his breath for being diligent at being a good coder, is that the only way that this is of value is by having good, consistent grades. The, the, you know, the evolution of the protocol for PACP is one that is made and, and tested on, you can make repeatable observations. So they're of real value, and they're of real value in terms of that severity scale that's there. And, and I'll give some examples of it because that scale means an awful lot in terms of interpreting the data consistently. But we, this two-step process is really one of, of taking your raw PACP data and, and in the context of, of, of post-processing it, I would call that just an internal condition grade. You use the raw defect scores. You can certainly at one end of the spectrum know that there's not a lot of severe defects and at the middle of it and at the higher end of it, things that you need to look at. The key thing to getting understanding of remaining useful life or to make observations that we can quantify are to understand what I would call a structural performance grade. And, and that means we have to apply supplementary information. We need to think about what, what is causing the pipe to break and what's likely to cause it to, to deteriorate further. And we're going to rationalize the probability of collapse. And that's what the, the core of a two-step process is. So if you look at it in a diagram, it kind of looks like this. The ICGs that we have, those one to five ratings, and, and, and typically I just use PACP quick scores to get an understanding of the worst defect in the section, and that gives you a really, really good understanding of what's going on there, and I'll talk about that in, in a moment. But the things that are a one and a two in terms of severity don't have a lot to do with contributing to the deterioration, irrespective of what they are, whether they're fabric decay, whether they're, whether they're uh, uh, fractures, the, the, the nature of the coding is such that if they're one and two, they're not gonna, they don't have, you know, time attached to it. The, the crystal thing that happens at, at the severity three level of codes is that we end up with defects that should catch our attention in terms of understanding that with the right conditions around the pipe or the right, you know, the circumstances, in essence, they might contribute to deterioration accelerating. If it's a four or five, in essence, uh, by definition, a four is something that a random event could cause it to become a five, could fall down. And, and that means we need to look at it 
We need to understand, is that an emergency repair? Or in the case of some of the stuff that Mark has, because you get into the R brand of this and look at really expensive sewers, you can monitor these things and get a much better understanding of things that in essence look like they're failed by a lot of definitions are failed, but can sit there and be safely managed through different protocols. And, and, and those are the, that's the essence of it, of taking this supplementary data, assessing risk of failure. And, and I didn't invent this system, but we've, we've taken a lot of work that came out of the sewer rehabilitation manual. And it is a well-documented protocol to go through from taking your initial data, applying what you know, and, and, and taking it to the next step. So if we go to the next slide, this started a long time ago about understanding pipes, rigid pipes. Uh, I, I would say that they're complex beasts. And if you, you want to get some entertainment, you go back and look at poor Anson Marston, who started to look at this. And, and, you know, I always say that it is good to get in the head of the designer. Well, if you want to know what design looked like in 1918, that's what it looked like. Is, is that we did things in real experiments, full, you know, full, you know, full trials. Uh, one of the initial premises that, that, uh, that Marston had was that it was going to be as simple as if I took the weight of the soil on the pipe and applied that to the pipe, the pipe would, I'd, I'd understand that. I, they knew enough about structures. And, and sadly, that basic principle didn't fly. It didn't, you know, it didn't work. And then the two common things they found out early that were very puzzling is that they found that they broke a lot of these pipes just by installing them. And then the other thing they found is that, is that what they called a considerable time was that the consolidation process in open cut construction is probably the worst thing that a lot of these pipes see. And that's when loads get developed and, that's, that's, and it doesn't normally take a long time. From what we know about consolidation, you can under, you know, understand an awful lot about these pipes if you go look at them 30 days after they're installed just allow some of the consolidation process to occur. So if we go to just the, to, you know, Marston's work and it is, it is downloadable and, and as some of the, the, the neatest observations, you know, in terms of, of that first advancement of load theory uh, was of real value. And, and uh, anyone who, you know, wants to get some insight into it, I'd fully recommend pulling them down. You don't have to be a, an engineering buff, but as a history buff, and some of the thought processes and understanding what they had to understand or, or to grapple with their heads is very, very informative in terms of understanding how these pipes break. The key things that came out of their research, and if you would go to the, the, the next one, the key things that, that they found is that a concrete pipe and a clay tile pipe, aside from the concrete pipe can, you know, over time will get be subject to fabric decay. We'll talk about that in a second. They, they were the same thing. They're just rigid pipes. And, and many of the failures, you know, that we saw were either cracked pipe, you know, under less than displaced earth. The first thing they found is that basic formula didn't work. Uh, and they also found that the bigger the hole they cut, the more the load they saw in the pipe typically. And that was the first concept of understanding what soil arching was. And, and, and Mark will talk about that a little later today. Soil arching is, a, is, a, is an awesome phenomenon to understand. But in essence, before the pipe breaks, what it sees is because of arching or you know, the angle of friction through the soils, it'll always see more weight than, than in essence, the, the, the pipe is, um, than, it, you know, the, than the displaced soil directly above the pipe. Once it starts to break, in essence, that's all it sees. And that's the concept of a prism road in, 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 in flexible pipes. What they also found is that, is that the, the bedding that they did had a huge impact on, on the ability of the pipe to resist load. They also found that if they just dumped concrete around it, that that was pretty good bedding material. And we never advanced that concept until really, you know, uh, uh, many, many years later, 60, 80 years later, we started to experiments with, you know, with upgrading uh, uh, controlled low strength density fills. But I thought the most fascinating thing that they found is that in all the testing they did, they could break the pipe, but they couldn't collapse it. Literally, their test setups didn't have enough energy to collapse the pipe. And that's fascinating. And, and that tells you an awful lot about, you know, what a rigid pipe is that's broken. And if you would go to the, you know, to the, the next slide, you have to advance to, you know, really up until the 1970s and 1980s before someone started to examine that from a practical perspective. There's a fellow named Trot in the UK. And, and from what I can see in literature, because I don't know Mr. Trot, is that for about 40 years of his life, it looks like he spent designing concrete in a manner that wouldn't break. And then for that period from the 1970s into the early 1980s, he started to break concrete. 
He started to break concrete pipes and understand what he you know, would try to articulate. There's a little animation there. He did big soil, uh, big field trials, soil, uh, uh, soil tests, and, and the core of what you know, he found in, in terms of key things is that, is that the load required to collapse the pipe, because he had a lot more gun power. He was determined to break these pipes down and make them collapse. Is the load required to completely collapse it was often, you know, was grossly in excess, sometimes five or six times more than the, you know, the, just because of that mobilization of passive pressure. Because once those hinging cracks, once he broke the pipe, in essence, it mobilized the strength of the soil, increased it, and what caused the pipe to fail over time was not the fact that the pipe was broken, but only the fact that, as Jerry said, now the water can flow in and out of the pipe, we're gonna lose some soil structure, and that's what causes the deterioration process. And, and what he considered is basically five or 10% loss of cross-section was structurally stable. And what happened as increase, as you see it, you know, the more that we allow it to deform, the higher degree of variability. Uh, and, and typically these pipes would, would start to fall down at about 30% loss of cross-section. But from a structural perspective, we generally, if we see good evidence of hinging, good evidence of what I call stability, in essence, that structure is stable up to about 10% loss of cross-section. But the considering of you know, failure is, that's what we, you know, we look at the hinges and that's why we look at it in more detail. So if you go to the, the, the next slide, what, that, that kind of goes to what the core of what, what Jerry said, is that for the pipe to break, it's the movement of soil around the pipe. For hinging, that's a very, that's a very unique one, and that's kind of one form of classic deformation or loss of grade with a concrete pipe or clay tile pipe over time. And, and it's not what causes the defect that causes the pipe to deteriorate. It's the loss of ground. And we can see the loss of ground, we can infer the loss of ground by how the structure responds, and if we start to think about what's around the pipe, we can, we can actually make reasonable, reasonable engineering judgment on when to intervene. Obviously, if we stop that loss of ground, and it's one of the things that Kaz is gonna talk about, is, is that by, by doing something to stop that loss of ground, we'll buy a new life in, in, the, in the context of it. Another classic form of, of loss of ground is the fact that for many years, there's a concept in industry of what was called a soil tight pipe. A soil tight joint, a soil tight joint, and it, it was a joint that we, we never started to put gaskets routinely into gravity sanitary sewers until the 1970s. And, and that means we've got a lot of pipes that water can flow in and out of the joint. And if water can flow in and out of the joint at some particle size, so can the soil. And if the soil goes, and Jerry will tell you as well, you've seen all of us who've looked at CCC have seen this progressive type of of degradation of loss of grade of a pipe. We call them sewer sags. The sag itself doesn't mean anything other than it could be an operational issue, but in essence, that's what you're seeing is you're seeing the progressive loss of ground. In, in progressive loss of ground, again, that, that, that we can live with the maintenance issues and, and address it. It's one of the things that grouting is very, very effective at because again, we can stop the loss of ground. We can build a new joint without building a new pipe. And that's one of the things that we talk about intervention. So those are, those are two classic forms of deterioration that we see a lot. And if you look at the next one, if anyone is kind of afraid of these, these upper figures, start thinking about brick pipes. The brick pipes, if you don't have a faith in pipe-soil interaction, understand that brick pipes are nothing but. Brick pipes are held together by uniform soil pressure. And brick pipes, you ought to be terrified because it's not just one fracture, there's a whole bunch of spots for water to go in and out. So brick pipes are particularly susceptible to loss of ground. And when they start to lose cross-section, their remaining useful life gets taken away from you. I don't know how many times I've spent a lot of time in my life I could write a, a new book on, on emergency repairs. Because if you work in any sort of assessment program where by the time a sewer gets assessed to the time you're fixing it, the emergency repairs are on brick pipes. Because brick pipes have a much shorter window than, than typically rigid pipes in the context of it. If you look at the last form of deterioration that we're going to talk about here, H2S attack. And the question is, is H2S attack you know, related to loss of ground? Well, obviously it's not related to a loss of ground until it loses, you know, exposes itself to the ground. If you look at the, 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 the process itself, and then you can just click the animation, and you will see that H2S, which is a very, very common type of breakdown of concrete, and appreciate a breakdown of concrete, not clay tile. Is it, is it H2S, is, is, is uh, hydrogen sulfide coming out of solution? 
and uh, and basically going through a process where it turns itself into sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid and concrete are not friends. And sulfuric acid breaks down iron, it breaks down concrete, very, very unfriendly. And the warmer the wastewater, the you know, I know that that the more south that someone lives on the on the world, the closer to the equator, I know the the more that they experience H2S attack because the warmer the wastewater, the easier this comes out of solution. So those are things that can be studied and, and certainly in the context of what Mark will show you, he will show you some really, really good examples of understanding H2S attack and, and trying to understand it in terms of predicting it. But that is a, a core thing in the terms of, we look at these things and I think in our heads, maybe we think about them just deteriorating or falling apart. The concrete that, you know, that, the, that the Romans built, it's, it's in essence, when we go and look at these structures, the concrete that the Romans built really isn't any weaker than it was when they built it. In essence, unless there's something acting on it to break it down. In the Mediterranean climate, the reason the Romans concrete lasted so long is not that because they made really good concrete, actually they made pretty poor concrete, which was you know typical for the time, but in essence, it sits in an environment that doesn't break it down from the outside, and they never used it to move wastewater around. They used it to move water around from a practical perspective, and the water conduits all last. Anything that had sewers, they, those are broken down from H2S attack. So understanding that in terms of the, you know, the materials. Clay is a really critical material because clay is, is relatively inert. And, and when we look at the mechanical properties from clay that we knew that was built 100 years ago, and we go and measure its mechanical properties now, we won't see that it's changed. So clay is, again, a very material that, that resists that type of material, that type of breakdown. Next slide. So what type of things affects the rate of soil loss? The, the first one that we're going to talk about is just something as simple as the size of the defect. If we have defects that are very small, basically a sixteenth of an inch, the ability for soil transfer to take place is very low. So when we look at severity in, in, in it, by the time you get up to half an inch, you can you can be, have almost anything outside the pipe short of a you know a control density fill, and you're going to have rapid ground movement. So just you know the the, the size of the you know the, the defect. The next thing that we talked about is groundwater. So the hydraulic conditions. Obviously, if you go look at your PACP coating and you see gushers. You see, you know, you won't see them at every joint because the, the, the pipe has been converted to uh, a French drain, but you will see some gushers, you will see runners, you'll see excessive. You know that the groundwater table is not only above the sewer, but it's active. And that's, 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 that facilitates a lot of transfer, as Jerry said. The other thing that you will see is, is surcharge conditions. Now, in surcharge conditions, in essence, you will see that one of the reasons that we get concerned about operating a combined sewer versus a sanitary sewer is that by design, we, we run them as storm sewers, and that means we surcharge them, often frequently. If you have a sewer that actually we sit out into the ocean and we let the tide go up and down, up and down every day, we have very, very, you know, tidal variations, daily variations. The, the more that the, you know, the, the water flows in and out, the higher the risk. And the last one to look at is the soil type, as Jerry mentioned. And certainly fine grain soils, things that are cohesive, clays. Clays can sit, I, I, as, as Kaz will get to relate, and I get to relate, I, I live in the, the bottom of an old uh, uh, glacial lake Agassiz, so I live in, this, in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a sea of clay. And uh, as a result, we can see sewers that, that look awful, but they're gonna look awful for a long period of time because the soil movement is gonna be very slow because we have a very highly plastic clay. It's one of the reasons to understand original construction because if we tunneled it as opposed to open cut it, in essence, the soil distribution is completely, you know, completely different. And there's very, very little you know, chance for growl movement, especially in clays, if it's instructed by tunneling. So there are all things that we can use to apply good engineering judgment in terms of, of rationalizing what it means that, you know, of, a, of a specific severity of defect. Next slide, please. The, the objective of this is that severity, those things that Jerry hammers into you of getting severity you know, correctly are of immense value. So if you think about them from a practical perspective, the, the implications of severity one defects are that you, in essence, it doesn't matter whether it's 100 years old, is you're looking at something that's brand new, okay? And that's, a, that's from a practical perspective, if you see no defects, you see a pipe at rest with its environment and certainly nothing from the inside and it's easy enough to understand the material and the chemistry, electrochemistry of the soil on the outside to understand that there's something going on in the outside. 
you will see the first advent of defects, twos. And, and the twos are of such a severity that if you look at them, you might see some circumferential joints, you might see a moderate joint defects in there, but in essence, not a lot of paths for, you know, for the soil to flow. So basically we have something that has the first signs of defects, deterioration is, is, is possible, but in essence, it's not gonna happen in the short term. It's gonna happen over a much longer term. Three is a, is a switch. And as soon as we start to see loss of cross-section in rigid pipes, something zero to 5%, we see some, some longitudinal you know, cracking, turning into fractures here and there, starts of loss of level, badly made connections. Those are all things that mean that someone has turned the switch on and the deterioration process with the right conditions on the outside can accelerate. A four is a critical stage because it's a pipe that is basically holding together. What's gonna to cause a four turn into a five? A random event, a water main break, someone digging a hole next to the pipe, a big rainstorm, things we can't predict. So things that are elevated to a four or a five is a, is a, is a, are critical things because they're either broken or they're waiting for a random event to make them broken. And those are things that Mark will spend time on because he spends a lot of time looking at, 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 at fours and fives and and, and in, in, in critical sewers that you have to take a good look at. So these are, these are valuable things that we can do. There is a procedure to, to, to post-process your initial observations by using the relatively simple observations that we talked about. And that is in the, in the next slide. Oh, just to give you just a visual, and you could just click through these, that's a, that's, a, that's a one, that's a two, that's a three, that's a four, and nobody has a problem knowing that this is a five in the context of those visual classifications. Those implications are clear when we see them. So the, the way that we deal with these in terms of turning ICGs into to, to, uh, S, SPGs is, is a really simple process. You click. You take your PACP quick score, which is a very valuable thing. I look at quick scores and I, I, get, a, I get a vision of a histogram down a pipe. I get the, I get a, a, the number of severity five defects. I will go mine them for what they are. If they're, if they're fractures and if they're longitudinal fractures versus circumferential, I'll know how many of them are out there. So I understand kind of the spatial, I'll know the second, and you get a good visualization of where you are in that score. And if you would go to the, the, the next one, please. It's that following that initial process, the post-processing of these to sit there and, and elevate that is to look at the internal condition grade Take your soil type in terms of low, medium, and high risk, and basically look at frequency of surcharge, and there's a similar type of process to apply for groundwater effects, and, and basically you will elevate or decrease your grade to understand the implications of the, of, the, of, of the grade you're in. So you will take your PACP. Mark has a very elaborate process for doing that, and in, in high risk, high consequence pipes, believe me, it's worth it. You invest the time to understand the, you know, the, the, five to three decimal places in terms of, of, and maybe four decimal places or five in terms of investing it. But for the vast majority of stuff we do in a typical rehab program, we're going in and we're fixing things that are, that are you know, uh, in, a, in, a, in a big city, uh, typically 85 to 95% of the rehabilitation program is 18 inches and under. And those are things we need to post press data, make rapid decisions, and, 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 and we pick our high consequence assets and we treat them with more respect and invest more money to understand, you know, to, to a greater degree what those things are. Next slide, please. The, the, you can take these things once you resolve them and, and think about them in terms of a, of a capital program. You could click three times and, and we'll, I'll just unfold it. So the, the SP3, you know, ones that you see that, that come out of that, are, are something that logically are gonna be somewhere between three years and 10 years. And, that, and, and we may not know it, and quite frankly, they can be longer than 10 years because something in clay can sit there for a long period of time. Some of these trigger what our capital program, and some of them you know, trigger indicators as to when we should go look at the sewer again. By the time we're at a four, again, those are things that, that logically need to be fixed. It's gonna be a random event. You may fix some of your fours. Some people are luxury to have funding, in essence, to do fours in a year one. Uh, but somewhere between two to five, that typically makes up most people's capital program. And the reason that we have to be cautious with fours is because we're waiting for a big rainstorm. We're waiting for someone to dig a hole beside a pipe. We're waiting for something that doesn't really relate to just soil movement. We're relating to something that can accelerate it. It's very exposed. It's very vulnerable. At the five, we don't need it. It's not rocket science. We don't usually have 
you know, a problem with understanding fives, the, the, the thing that Jerry will provide a good overview is, is this mystery that the fact that a lot of things are broken, but they'll just sit there because the consolidation process is gone and they can be at risk, especially if you're in fine grain soils, that stuff can just sit there. And, and it's important to understand that in terms of, of consequence. So as we move these forward into sort of some sort of, of rationale as to what we do with this, is it is you're going to apply your risk model because not all of these have the same response. A lot of what we know is is making sure that we go back and look at these things at a sufficient frequency, and and you build your capital programs around these. So your you know stuff that sits at a performance grade five is broken. So you're going to evaluate whether it needs to be fixed. And then you're going to plan it. You know it's clap risk, and if it's clap risk, you're going to monitor it frequently. The, the, you're going to vary your inspection frequency, but you'll build your capital program around the, the risk profile that you put, and you're going to you're going to go in and take more risk because a lot of the fives on low criticality pipe, you can wait for them to, to fail. You can run them to failure. Next slide, please. The 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 core of this is that we will look at these and 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 rigid pipes basically. A lot of the deterioration. We have two kind of major, you know, drivers. One that I think Jerry will evaluate it, or uh, uh, Mark will evaluate in more detail, and one that Kaz is going to talk about it is certainly this loss of ground is is a is a key driver. And understanding something as simple as clay size in in Canada, for me to understand the ground around the pipe, I got to go to every university. One of the things you have in the U.S. environment is a database known as the USDA. Soils database it was originally built for agricultural purposes. It's one of the most valuable tools for screening your infrastructure that you will ever find as an engineer in terms of understanding hydrogeology, geology, and the nature. And it's a very, very good screening tool to understand sort of a lot of these supplementary factors. We've used it in many jurisdictions to get a better understanding of post-processing PACP data. If if you have a you know like the the, the, the other end of it is, is understanding that if it's fabric decay, there's a lot of ways that we have to look at microbiologically, look at the, you know, the science of the way the material's breaking down and what's the breakthrough for the pipe. And, and again, until the defects basically present a, a mean for soil mechanism, we're dealing with fabric decay and, and we can use our eyes to understand when it's exceeded the limit state. PACP is the start of this process, but you gotta consider other factors to get a good handle on, on what that is. And it's, it's events that drive them. You can't predict them to three decimal places, but with good judgment, boy, you can be close enough. You can be close enough in terms of managing risk, and you can have a very, very intelligent system that relates both your reinspection and your prevention. And, and, and as Kaz is going to present, just inventing, you know, intervening early enough that the, the concept of, of stopping that flow movement with the right rehabilitation method is, is gold in the context of, of, of what it is. So with that, I'm going to move on. I'll introduce a, a, a good friend of mine. I've, I've known Kaz, it dates him, that I've known him almost all my whole career. And uh, at two different points in Kaz's life, we were colleagues working for the same company. Uh, he took about a 10-year sabbatical on me and then came back. And uh, we would both butt heads and collaborate and work together. And then uh, by about 1997, 1997, I guess the early 2000s, we we built a city of Winnipeg program together and then uh, he decided he would just go over and, 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 and operate it. So in 2001, 2002, he became a client of mine and uh, he is a design and construction engineer with the city of Winnipeg. He's going to be talking about, you know, the, the, the fixing of things, stopping of soil movement, that stopping of the hydrogen sulfide process, the, you know, putting a barrier in there and putting a solution in. And he's going to show, uh, just uh, you know, the the remarkable idea of how to squeeze remaining use of a, a whole new life out of it with cured in place pipe in terms of a, the, the legacy of work done in, in Winnipeg. With that, I will I will turn it over to Kaz. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, so we've got another poll. Um, when was the first CIPP installed in North America? We've got uh, several options. We've got 1968, 1975, 1977, 1983, and 1989. Um, Curious to see what the uh, the poll results are. Pretty good. Uh, Thirty six percent saying nineteen seventy seven. 
1968, 10%, and 1989, 8%. Well, you'll find out the answer in my presentation. So uh, with that, I'll get started. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to talk about is the history of uh, CIPP use in Winnipeg, uh, some of the results of the physical testing that we've done on the early installs, and uh, the results of our visually inspected, uh, we've visually inspected thousands of liners, and uh, the CIPP rehab and its impact on RUL. Next slide, please. So Winnipeg's first installation of CIPP was in 1978. Uh, that those sewers are now 42 years old and still in service. Uh, inspections after many years of service, we've determined to have uh, excellent visual conditions and excellent mechanical properties. Next slide, please. Uh, CIPP came to America to the United to North America in 1977. So 36% of you were quite correct on that. Uh, Winnipeg was a little uh, was um, very aggressive in, in ch chasing this new technology. We started some trial installations in 1978. Uh, two locations were chosen: uh, Kingsway and Richards Avenue. Uh, we had a uh, poor contractor from California with working with a licensee from uh, British Columbia in a Winnipeg winter. Uh, neither one of them was familiar with temperatures of minus 20, minus 25 when they had to work under those conditions. Uh, the project required 1,038 feet of lining, uh, 679 feet was uh, found to be acceptable, 379 feet was rejected, and the contractor eventually walked away from 655 feet of pipe. Next slide, please. The uh, project manager at the time uh, wrote a report to uh, City Council, um, first of all, to terminate the contract with the contractor because they failed to meet their obligations. But in his report, he was quite the visionary. He, next slide, please. He, uh, he spoke about, uh, even though there were some difficulties and challenges uh, with this first attempt, uh, the, uh, he saw benefits of it. He saw with a little bit of tweaking here and there and a larger boiler and working in some better conditions that there could be a future to this. And uh, he, as he said in his report, he was an eternal optimist with uh, great hope for the future. And he was quite quite the visionary. Uh, Kingsway was installed in 1978. These photos were taken in 2004. And as you can see, uh, the pipe is in excellent condition. Uh, the liner is in excellent condition. There's no, no, no delaminations, no, no loss of ovality. It continues to function as it was designed. Next slide, please. Similar circumstances on, uh, on Richard. Same, it was the same project, 1978. And the photos uh, indicate a uh, well-functioning sewer. Next slide, please. Uh, because of this, uh, the city of Winnipeg en engaged uh, in further CIPP installations on a trial basis between 1984 and 1989. We had uh, three trial projects. April 1984 required an interceptor sewer application on Archibald Street in the Mission Secondary, the Mission Secondary Sewer. 1986, we did one on Henderson Highway using an epoxy resin, and in 1989, a vinyl ester resin on Notre Dame Avenue. Next slide, please. The uh, Mission Secondary Sewer, uh, 762 millimeter concrete pipe, 30 inch in diameter, 8.2 meters deep, approximately 27 feet, was installed in 1935 and was in line with CIPP in 1984. This, this particular sewer is, carries some of the highest industrial loads in the city of Olympic. It's actually downstream at the time from some of the, uh, the two major uh, meat packing plants and, and the industrial load was quite large on this sewer, creating a lot of uh, distress to the pipe over the years. Next slide, please. This, the, the, the distress to the pipe was a uh, significant H2S attack. This were the pre-lining videos. You can see significant H2S, H2S attack in the crown of the pipe, significant loss of section and uh, loss of structural integrity. Next slide, please. You could actually, show C-sections where there was complete loss of section and the, the backfill was actually exposed at that point. Next slide, please. Uh, so we put out a contract uh, in 1989 um, for, uh, to, to line the sewer, a local contractor, Dominion Construction, uh, won the contractor with using his uh, creative uh, tendering techniques of uh, $269,269. Uh, which translated to $1.77 per meter per millimeter diameter or 378 a foot per inch diameter. 
uh, and uh, he engaged the work with a um, contractor from um, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Next slide, please. The, uh, the lining started at 2 a.m. on a Friday night and ran through until noon the following day. This was a very challenging lining project for the time, 656 feet of three quarter inch thick tube at a depth of 27 feet. Uh, it was definitely pushing the limits of the day. This was followed by a 12 hour cure, followed by a five hour cool down. Next slide, please. And just some typical photos. Uh, this is the start of the installation, a typical installation process. Next slide. Uh, the photos you see of this installation from 1984 are very similar to what we see today. Uh, this is the boiler. Uh, what we may see now more often than a boiler is we see more steam applications, but uh, very typical of what we see today on our lining projects. Next slide, please. Well, since 1970 to 94, liner design had commenced. Uh, prior to 1983, there was no design. Uh, those initial liners that were installed on Kingsway and on Richard were uh, standard six millimeter thick liners with no real thought given to uh, loading or the condition of the pipe. In 1983, Institute of Farm North America uh, published its first design manual in 1983. And if we uh, calculate uh, the procedures identified in that manual under the conditions under Kingsway, Kingsway should have been a nine millimeter diameter pipe. Richard should have been a 17 millimeter diameter pipe and Archibald should have been a 21.9 millimeter diameter. So next slide, please. Um, as I've seen in previous slides, these were samples cut out of the, uh, out of the, the 1978 uh, samples, and you can see there's no delamination of liner, six millimeter thickness, uh, a completely competent liner. Next slide, please. Mission secondary sewer, 21 millimeters in thickness, a lot, uh, as the slide says, a lot more beef to it, and uh, reacting quite well. Next slide, please. The tensile properties at the time, uh, we were interested in uh, the fluctual strength being 8,200 PSI and flip modulus elasticity at 240,000 PSI. The results we were getting on Kingsway at the high end where the fluctual modulus was 272,000, at the low end, 375,000. Fluctual strength at the low end was 5,500 PSI and at the high end, 7,300 PSI and very similar results on, on Richard. Next slide, please. The 1984 installation mechanical properties were excellent as well. We had an average fresh fluctual modulus, uh, an average of 380,000 PSI, with the average fluctual strength of 47, 4,800 PSI. And we had good felt composite behavior in the stress strain curves that you see below. It was very, very um, excellent uh, reaction to the loadings. Next slide, please. Well, this is a photo of the post-aligning video, uh, 1984, and uh, the photo in 2011. As you can see, technology and video capture has Im improved immensely. Uh, interesting, you can see in this uh, photo in the upper right-hand corner, you can see a bit of a wrinkle in the 1984 video of a shot. And in the 192011 one, you can still see that wrinkle there. So basically, there's been no change to the liner over those years. Next slide, please. So how have the liners been assessed over time? And how many have we looked at? Well, the city of Winnipeg, we did a lot of looking at our liners and we've done a lot of testing and sewer inspections. In 1997, we started our, our modern condition assessment program. We've inspected 100% of our combined, combined sanitary sewers and over half of the storm sewers. We've inspected over 2,000 miles of sewers since 1997. Since 1984, we've had 17 trial installations and they've been, been re-inspected on a one to two year cycle. And in all cases, the mechanical properties have been coming at, back similar to 1970, 74 installations. The, uh, since 1997, our modern sewer rehab program, we started, started an annual large, large program of ranging of approximately $15 million to $20 million a year, depending on the budget cycle where 85 to 95% of that budget was being directed strictly to CIPP. So it's, I think at this point in time now, it's, it's almost 95% that we're, we're attacking strictly CIPP jobs. Uh, from 1989 through 2012, we had one year warranty inspections on, on our post lining uh, projects, over 1600 locations. And we've also inspected many hundreds uh, through modern condition assessment programs. Next slide. 
the net result was that we've gone back and we looked at all these liners and we've tried to identify the, the defects in those liners. And the biggest def defect was the 64% showing wrinkling, bunching, folds, pinch, snag, really not defects, more cosmetic, but not causing any, any structural defect or cause to the problem. A lot of minor defects, uh, liner cut poorly shown only 2%, uh, blank, no comments, 3%, uh, bumps, you know, 5%. Some very minor, minor defects through those 1600 uh, applications. So uh, these liners are holding up extremely well. Next slide, please. So you can see some of the defects here, like upper right hand corner might be a hole, uh, lower right hand corner would be some of the wrinkling, uh, the one in the center would be a little bit of a bubbles. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, when we're reinspecting our liners, what kind of questions should we be asking? Well, does the liner have any visual evidence of material degradation? To date, none has been found. Is there any evidence of abrasion or wear? None has been found. At manholes or defective service connections, are there any evidence of disbondment of the CIPP from the host pipe? To date, none has been found. In instances where a closed fit can be confirmed visually, is there still evidence of a closed fit? Minor defects have been brought into inventory as some interpreted terminations, but no breakdown of closed fit. So installations with produced pronounced ovality, is the ovality increased over time? We have not seen that. And we've, we've lined some sewers with ovality 15%, probably in the odd case, approaching 20%, and they're hanging in there. So liners are becoming a very good solution for, us, for our problem, for our sewers. Thank you. Next slide. So here's a sample of a liner, uh, five years old. Uh, excellent condition. Next slide. Ten year old, ten years old. Uh, liners are functioning extremely well. Next slide. Uh, Thirty years ago. Um, again, the post lining video showing you the wrinkle here, and uh, we talked this slide about uh, and and to today's standards. Excellent, uh, excellent video composition. Next slide. Uh, Forty two year old on Richard and on um, on Kingsway. Uh, the liners are holding up extremely well and uh, continue to provide good service to the city of Winnipeg. Next slide. So in conclusion, uh, we've got a long history of CIPP installation. Uh, over 200 kilometers has been in over these years. We had some early challenges, but we've gone through them. We've made it through. They're all working excellent conditions. Our in-service CIPP liners need to be assessed judiciously to isolate any inherent post pipeline defects and liner defects. And based on these reviews, we believe that these liners will have a very long life, well past the 50 years that F1216 indicates. They may well last hundreds of years. Uh, we follow standard construction and acceptance protocols over the life of the program, and that's been adequate to achieve these good results. We use AST F1216 and D5813, and we do lots of testing. Next slide, please. And thank you. And here's a measles map showing the results of all the testing over the years. Uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of tests uh, under plate samples and pipe samples showing the, uh, the flexural strengths. Thank you. Oh, excellent. Thank you, uh, Kaz. Uh, quick question for Kaz and Chris. Uh, we did have our uh, poll question about, uh, you know, the um, pipe that wasn't deteriorated, old VCP. So what, what's your answer? Leave it in. Leave it in. Yeah. Well, it, it, if it has no defects and it's clay, if it's a one and it's a hundred years old and and it, it's still a one, and okay. and, uh, and 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 that's a reality. The bell curve is very very big, so don't let age overly bias. You know, I I'm not saying that you know if it was a concrete and it was one you might take a serious look at whether, you know, what the chemistry of the soil is, because we'd be breaking down from the inside face, but traditionally clay, uh, it does not break down from either, you know, it'll, it'll fracture, but you rarely, rarely see material degradation. But if it's a one, it's a one. And, uh, and, and it's gonna be in the books as being the next century of one. It's important to look at whether you're, you're changing things over time, eh? If you're changing the loading conditions on it, but, but it stays in from my perspective. Okay. If well, I could just add that, if I could just add that, Chris, you know, sure. basically the, the, the clay pipes that we've seen that, that are in excellent condition, Winnipeg, uh, they've been um, 
if they were ins properly installed, properly bedded, and properly backfilled, they will last forever. Uh, it's uh, if you have improper construction techniques that stresses the pipe, that's when when clay can become a can become a problem. Babylonian the Babylonians will be coming over here in in uh, in another six thousand years to dig them up. So. Okay. Good. I think I'll be retiring about that time. Um, <laughs> so um, moving forward um, and, and give some perspective on, on the next presentation um, from the Archibald sewer uh, uh, example that Cash showed that was concrete pipe and from a PACP standpoint that was probably a surface damage uh, aggregate projecting and uh, grade three and even up to a grade five. At that point that they did the rehab, it was about 50 years. And then our deterministic view of uh, pipe age uh, and end of life, um, it was there. But as you saw there, um, that pipe is probably going to last 120 years or longer based on the, uh, the rehab. So our asset and our mindset here is really not from the 50 years. It's from the 50 years times a multiplier. And that's a good transition to uh, the large diameter uh, perspective that Mark Holstead's going to provide. Um, Mark's with Albuquerque uh, Bernio uh, County Water Utility Authority, which I just call the Water Utility Authority. I've known Mark for over uh, 20 years. Uh, we've evolved uh, uh, together in our understanding and, and passion for the work. What I like about Mark is that not only does he have the practicum of doing the collection systems manager part of it, He's also a pretty good design engineer and also has an academic background in analyzing this. He has some very interesting things to talk about when it comes to grade, what a grade five can be and should be uh, evaluated and how one moves forward with it. So Mark, uh, thank you for joining us and the floor is yours. Well, thank you. I believe there's a poll question. I think we'll move this rather quickly along here. Is it possible to differentiate the ACP? Grade five observation based on defect. I believe we have one more speaker after me. Is that correct? I will move that, along that, quickly. That is correct. Okay. Let's go ahead and uh, move forward then. Ah, all done. Let's go to the next one. So a little bit of bio on who we are. We're, uh, we're an owner, we are a user. Uh, the Water Authority was created in 2007 to provide water and sewer services uh, for our service area. We were previously that a, a part of the city of Albuquerque. We serve about two thirds of a million people you know, for sewer, sewer, sewer services and about 2,400 uh, miles of sewer, as you can see. So this presentation is about P, uh, interceptors and we're gonna look at PACP. We do use PACP for all of our TV, small and large diameters. We adopted it around 2010 when we got some new TV units. Um, and uh, we, we've, we, asset management plans are important to us, and I'm sure they are to many of you. We had a, a major one done in 2011, and we're just finishing a one this year. Or it's been finished. So we're going to talk about that a bit. We've had some major TV efforts, and we're on a five-year cycle. Our next cycle will be in 2023. We focus on reinforced concrete pipes. That's our issue. We, uh, when we go televising our lines, we pretty much don't look at the rest because that's not where the problem is. Now we do have a lot of corrosion. We're not the hottest place in the world or by any means, but we do get up to about a upper 80s degrees Fahrenheit. And importantly, our concept of failure is collapse. A little bit of information on our interceptor systems here. The top uh, is, is a size distribution, and very frankly, it's a normal distribution for a, a large system. So I'm, I'm not gonna focus on that. But on the lower pie chart is a material, and that 31% RCP is where the action is. That's where our concerns are. That's what keeps our attention. So the upper left corner map here 
shows um, a um, pretty good um, map of where all of our concrete interceptors were. And, and, and the, green, the red ones are still concrete. The green ones have been rehabbed and the other colors were on, underway. And so that's actually not a bad picture in the lower left showing some rebar hanging. We've got much worse than that. I'll show you some of those. But we have a lot of damaged pipes. And it's interesting because uh, if you look at it, the newest pipe is, is about 40 years old now. It's, uh, I think, um, and um, we, we have 20 miles. We have a major portion of our system that's over 60 years old and 50 to 60. And so we have a lot of pipe. We have a lot of problems. So a little bit of background, uh, uh, refresher risk is a function of consequence of failure, as I believe you all would know, and likelihood of failure, uh, COF and LOF. So the way we do, and most people do, consequence of failure is a constant, pretty much for a given pipe. L likelihood of failure is based on observations and is expected to change. So likelihood of failure is the focus of this discussion. And obviously a very high likelihood of failure results in a very high risk. PACP, we, uh, we take our TV information and we take straight PACP compliant observations are migrated to our computerized maintenance management system, CMMS. And likelihood of failure is done after the PACP observations are migrated. And, and so that's, that's, how, that's kind of the mechanics of how we move the data. And then we grab that data and we do our level of our likelihood of failure scoring. We found that grade five was not adequate to our needs. And uh, we'll explain that. So the question is, why would you want to differentiate grade five? Well, risk scoring, which likelihood of failure and the grade mattered, um, help you identify funding needs looking way out in the future. But it's also used for a very important thing early, much more now, is how do we use limited funds to the best use? And, and when you have a lot of lines that uh, are grade five, how do you figure out which one to spend it on? And so it, you, you, can, you, can, you can differentiate it to meet your available funding. You can get a more accurate ranking of likelihood of failure. And very honestly, sometimes the grade fives haven't collapsed as quickly as we might have thought. Um, we didn't have that condition that, that required it. So in 2011, we had a, a really nice um, asset management plan. And we came up with these ratings, and these are not PACP grades, but we did break down the, uh, the grade fives and, uh, into a five rating, which was reinforced concrete showing. You can see in the upper left, in the upper right, it was projecting more. Uh, maybe you were past it. Um, and then seven, you've actually lost a good chunk of pipe. Most of that picture is actually soil, but the soil's hanging in there. And then the eight, it's starting to fall in. And those are all PACP grade fives, but our experience, our, uh, our experience would be that those are different levels, uh, likelihoods of failure. So in 2020, we moved away from the, the scoring in a, an asset management plan where, where, um, where, where you would do a, a major redo and that was then a static set. So we've gone to a, a situation that's stored in our GIS database. We compute consequence of failure, likelihood of failure, and the resultant risk scores are they're, uh, stored in the GIS database. The likelihood of failure scoring is algorithm based. If there's no TV, it's based on material and age. If we do have TV and each time we get TV, it's updated and recomputed. So the algorithm is complicated. It's based on PACP grades and various observations. 
you know, if we had a broken soil visible BSV, that would be pretty bad. That would get a high score, but it's not as bad as a broken void visible. So it was, it was some judgment calls specific to our system and, our, and what we consider to be a risk. Uh, we took it back down to a likelihood of failure score of one to five. And to get the highest score, you had to have TV. Our system of scoring is accepted. It is in the final programming. We've not quite implemented it. The, the IT uh, group has committed to get it uh, implemented this fiscal year. Um, and an interesting issue that we dealt with and the way we helped it, we handle is if you have a bad score, let's say you have a BSB and you have one, well, that gets the same likelihood of failure as if you had five. Yeah, it's not too far off, but we also had similar scoring systems for both the, the water systems, large and small diameter, and for our small diameter sewers. And uh, with that, I uh, want to say that if you've seen that picture, that's my great grandfather, um, first generation American in Lake Mills, Iowa, Ole Bredesen. I'm very proud of him. And thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, a lot of compelling information there that. Um, you know, especially from what we talked about, Mark, from the standpoint of that arching, that uh, even though the, the spangler marston equations could, uh, you know, predict that you're in a failure mode, you're just not finding it be, because the soil's kind of holding up. Is that correct? That is correct. And, and you know, as, as was mentioned earlier, you, you would need an event. I mean, a, a truck bouncing in the right way, perhaps. Certainly, if we had a uh, situation where the pipe was surcharged, uh, let's say we have a blockage in a pipe. Um, it, it has been, we haven't had that happen lately, but if we did, we then expected to have some uh, subsequent settlements upstream because some pipes was just waiting to have that happen. So yeah, it, it, the soil arching is real and we see it and, and we've seen those things sit there like that arch for years, unfortunately, because it took us a while to get some funding in some cases, but yes, mm -hmm. it's real. Well, thank you. Uh, we are running a little long on time, but uh, with your patience, uh, we have one more speaker, Khalil Rain. Uh, Khalil is uh, has is mo known to many people in the cured in place pipe uh, industry. What I like about Khalil and really respect is he is a lifetime learner, and I will just leave it at that. So, Khalil, um, take us home. Very good. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. And and again, I know we're running a little bit long on time, and I'll I'll make this. Uh, as brief as possible and still try to convey the information to you. This is going to act sort of as a conclusion and as a summation of what the different speakers have talked about. Um, we talk about the remaining useful life of, a, of an existing hose pipe. Uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about the, the how to extend that remaining useful life by renovating the hose pipe. How long can we make it last? Uh, in order to do that, we need to understand the design and quality assurance procedures that we're, we're going to look at and see in the, in the different host pipe and in the renovated pipe that we use to renovate the deteriorated host pipe. We talked a little bit about failure mechanisms. Uh, both Chris and uh, Chris Macy and Jerry talked about failure mechanisms. And in order to understand uh, how these pipes deteriorate and what we can do to stop them from continuing to deteriorate, We'll implement that knowledge in what we talk about in remaining useful life extension. The purpose of renovation is to prevent further deterioration of the hose pipe. Again, this all draws back to the failure mechanisms of the different types of pipe that we're dealing with, whether it be a rigid pipe or whether it be a flexible pipe. We want to repair the deteriorated hose pipe. We want to prevent infiltration with the repair that we do and we want to extend the remaining useful life of the pipe that we have in the ground. And we do this all by trenchless methods. The trenchless methods that we talked about are cured in place pipe. Kaz gave you a, an excellent presentation on the effect of using cured in place pipe in the Winnipeg area for renovating their small diameter lines. Other processes for trenchless renovation include slip lining, including coding and including fold and form type technologies. And you see example pictures of each of those in this particular slide. 
when we talk about extending the remaining useful life, we're talking about adding at least 50 years of remaining useful life to deteriorated pipe. With proper testing, with proper design, with proper quality assurance procedures and verification design, we can get lives greater than 100 years using these trenchless methods. And Kaz's, Kaz's presentation showed diagrams and pictures of uh, pipes that had been uh, evaluated every, everywhere from five years after installation to 42 years after installation, showing that these pipes remain in extremely good condition, some as good as when they were installed. And based upon that and based upon the theory, we expect to have remaining useful lives of the renovated product of at least 100 years after installation. The nice thing also is in, this, in these renovations, we're talking about having a product that's going to be much more efficient than the existing host pipe was in the fact that the flow capacity on these renovated products generally is going to be very good throughout its remaining useful life. Deterioration of, of flow capacity over time in a concrete pipe or in a clay tile pipe uh, is going to, to be much less than in some of these renovated products that are put in by trenches methods. The other positive note is the fact that we don't see fog elements as being a consideration in remaining useful life of the renovated products. Fats, oils, and greases just don't, uh, just, just don't have an influence in these renovated products over time. And this tends to give us uh, a very good understanding and idea as to what kind of performance we're gonna have in these renovations over time. And you, you can see the example in the lower right-hand corner of a fog-resistant liner after 38 years in the ground. Again, in, in, in understanding failure mechanisms, just to summarize it, when we talk about flexible pipes, the, the failure mechanism is gonna be buckling primarily. Uh, we can have some material degradation in some types of flexible pipes. We, we can have corrosive degradation uh, in some types of flexible pipes. In rigid pipes, the material degradation and the corrosive degradation tend to be much more common. In uh, types of liners and types of pipes that have been installed that have a reinforcement media such as fiberglass, we need to look at strain corrosion as a po possible means of deterioration over time. So this is what's going to affect the remaining useful life of the renovated products. Whether the pipe is designed properly to minimize the risk of buckling, whether the pipe is going to uh, remain a useful product over the entire life, whether the material is going to be corrosion resistant to the, to the environment that's flowing through it, and whether strain corrosion will play a factor. But those are the things that's going to affect the, use the remaining useful life. But all in all, the, 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 the most important comment can be, we can extend the remaining useful life by renovating these deteriorated pipes. If we understand why the host pipe is failing, we can stop continued failing in the host pipe and we can renovate it to provide extended remaining useful life. If we actually design and verify, we can make this renovation last for a very, very long period of time. And with that, this ends this presentation. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, as we wrap this up, um, some key points we'd like to leave with you, which is, uh, as Jerry said, uh, PACP is the beginning and not the end. Um, so if you're focused just on grade four, grade five structurals, uh, we recommend you take a, another look at it. As far as the 50 year number that we all live by, that's kind of deterministic, which means that uh, we need to take a, uh, a broader look at what we have because we're really looking out into the future of doubling or tripling that, especially when we apply the rehab. And as we move through the, uh, the idea of, of condition assessment and risk, really what we want to stress to you is that this is an exercise in engineering judgment. Um, PACP is an integral part of it. Assigning risk is certainly a, a big part of how we want to manage our system. But when it comes down to it, uh, we do have to look at things on a case-by-case -case basis and then make some uh, informed uh, decisions. And we believe from using those rules of thumb, you're going to get more out of your system at a lower overall cost. And with that, 
we thank you for your time. Uh, we'd like to wish you a happy holidays. And Sheila, you have the last word. Yes, thank you once again to everyone who participated. And I did mention earlier that um, Lynn Osborne is also part of our Technical Advisory Council. And he has been texting me that one of our poll questions was wrong, that um, CIPP was first used in North America in 1976, not 1977 at a zoo in Fresno, California. So God bless him for setting us all straight. Um, but with that, uh, please, once again, uh, I just want to say thank you to our panelists. You did a fantastic job. And I, I know that you provided great resource and information for our entire industry. Um, for uh, attendees, please watch for that follow-up email. We will give you the opportunity to ask us specific questions, and we will get back to you. If you are not a member of NASCO, you've got my personal invitation. Please visit nasco.org and join us. And then any technical questions throughout the year, anytime, you can always email tech at nasco.org. And in closing, thanks once again to all of our sponsors who made this possible. So have a happy, healthy holiday and know how much we appreciate you. Take care.